Let's go to learn song number 660, I Will Serve Thee. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. Sing it through one more time. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined life. Sir, why you died on Calvary, your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. And it's a mighty God that we serve, number 672. What a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him, heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him, heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him, heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God it is that we serve today. And Jesus is all the world to me. Nothing in this world can match up to him. Number 512. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad he makes me glad. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. My friend in trial sore, I go to him for blessings and he gives them more and more. He sends the sunshine and the rain, he sends the harvest golden grain, sunshine and rain, harvest and grain. He's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I this friend deny when he's so true to me? Following him, I know I'm right. He watches o'er me day and night. Following him by day and night, he's my friend. Jesus 
this is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy. He's my friend. And with him being the best friend you could ever have, number one, 520, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controls, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Every need he is supplying, plenteous grace he bestows. Every day my way gets brighter, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more that I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. And the best way we can serve him is to trust him and obey him, number 571. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toll he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. 
trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey we don't have it on there but flow if you'll turn to 800 number 800 again i just feel we need to sing this song once again it's what it's going to take for our country to change and to heal the things that are happening in our land is to turn them over to the Father and cry out to Him. We'll sing this song and have a time of prayer. Heal our land, Father, heal our land. Hear our cry and turn our nation back to You. O oh Lord, and heal our land. Forgive our sins and heal our broken land. Forgive our sins and heal our broken land. One more time. Heal our land, Father, heal our land. Hear our cry and turn our back to you. Lord, heal our land. Hear us, O Lord, and heal our land. Forgive our sin and heal our broken land. Forgive our sin and heal our broken land. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, with humble hearts and broken hearts. And uh, Lord, we just don't understand the things that are happening in our world today, not just in our land. But Lord, we came a nation to come together and be able to worship and fellowship with you freely without any cause. And Lord, it's getting closer for that to be taken away from us as a nation, as a Christian, as a church. And Lord, we just pray that you intervene and, and not intervene in such a way that we think the election is going to make a difference or the things of this world are going to make a difference. And Lord, we ask that you intervene in the life of everyone out there because that's what it's going to take. And Lord, you told us that if we want things to change, we have to turn turn from the things we're doing in our life, turn from the things that are of this world and not of you, and surrender our life to you in repentance and forgiveness and confession and humble ourselves before you. And Lord, may we do that this morning. And Lord, we just thank you for everything you do for us individually, for this church, and we continue to ask you, Lord, just to heal our land. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. So if you'll turn to Psalms 120, uh, I'm drawing a blank on which one I'm on, 123 I think it is this morning. Yeah, 123. This morning we continue our journey on the road to reach the Lord. This morning we continue our journey, like I said, on the road to reach the Lord, what's called the Psalms of Ascent. It was the journey that uh, Israel took uh, to worship the Lord in Jerusalem where they would come together and as they would come together they would sing these psalms when they reached the temple there were 12 steps or 15 steps to the to the temple they would stop and sing these songs in each step to remember and as we saw in 120 it starts with repentance and turning from the things of this world and they understood that when it comes to serving the Lord and then this, in 121 we saw that you have to trust in the Lord and rely on Him for all things. And then last week, we started to look at what it means to truly worship and why we worship and why we should be glad to come into the house of the Lord. 
Today, I want to look at in Psalms 123 an activity that we actually do as part of our daily lives. And it's an activity that actually occupies a lot of our time. No, it's not sleeping. That's not what I'm talking about. It actually applies to our roles that we have in life. You have roles as a parent, a spouse, uh, friends, uh, church members, uh, occupations, uh, whether you're an employee, uh, your occupation could be a homemaker, your occupation could be a business owner. So we all do this activity, and it takes up a lot of time in our daily lives, and it's actually an activity I'm talking about is serving others. As believers, we're part of a body, we're part of a community, and we're called by God's Word to serve one another. And we're supposed to follow the example of Christ. And the most dramatic example that occurs is in the Gospel of John, where the Lord humbled Himself and washed the feet of His disciples. And after He washed their feet, He told them this in John 13, John chapter 13, verse 14. He said, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I am giving you an example that you may do as I have done for you. Christ gave us an example of servitude, of what it means to serve other people. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, it says this, But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that have great exercise authority upon them. But it shall come not to be so among you. For whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So Lord Jesus Christ said, don't look at your role of who you are in this world. Look at your role as who you are as a Christian and serve me. And if you think about it, we actually spend most of our day serving someone. You don't believe it? If you prepare a meal for someone, you're serving someone. If you help a child with their homework, you're serving someone. If you mow someone's lawn, you're serving them. If you help them get their mail, you're serving them. If someone calls your church and says, I need you, you're serving them. A doctor serves his patients. And there's even occupations that don't have direct contact with any people, but it's an occupation of service. For instance, you take a computer program who programs machinery that is medical equipment to do certain diagnostics. He's not caring for the people. He's not doing anything for them. But the work that he's doing causes those people to be served through the doctors, nurses, and the hospitals. So it's an act of service. And then there's the little things we do every day for other people. The courtesies, the small favors. Uh, you see someone with an armload of packages and you stop and open the door for them. You're serving them. You, you watch uh, somebody ask you, hey, can, can you watch my kids for a minute? You're serving them. Um, we could go on and on. Uh, yesterday we were in Walmart, and lady behind us, we got grocery cart full, and lady behind us had a couple items. Joan said, here, go in front of us. She served them. Some lady dropped her cell phone. I bent down and picked it up for her because she had stuff in her hands. You're serving them. And you don't realize there's little things we're doing in life where we're serving people. You get the point, you understand there's really little time, little of our time that doesn't involve serving someone. But the only time we're actually probably not doing something for someone is when you're sleeping. So think about your routine and the things you do. Think about the people you encounter through this week and start to look at where you're serving in your daily part of life. And you'll understand that most of your time that you do in your life, you're doing something to benefit someone else. So why emphasize this point? Why would this psalm want the people to look at service as they took their journey to the Lord? 
The service is, is a topic that's addressed often in God's Word. We saw a couple of the verses. It's always in the form of a command that's given to us. Uh, usually when a pastor preaches on it, he's trying to convince the people that there's something that needs to be done and, and we need to serve in doing it. And that's true. We need to be challenged. We need to exhort others to serve as Christ. We need to be willing to make sacrifices in our life. We need to be willing to suffer inconveniences. And we need to be willing to relinquish our rights to do that service. But today I hope you see a little bit deeper understanding of what service is. If you start to recognize you're already serving people through your daily walk in life, whether directly or indirectly, and so when someone talks about servitude, we're not just dealing with a slice of Christian life that you're supposed to do. You're talking about a life that affects almost everyone you run into. We're talking about, does it really have to do with service? And if we're commanded to do service, how should we do it and why should we do it? But there's a difficulty when it comes to doing service we perform. A lot of times we find the service we do rewarding. You know, whether you're talking about work, sometimes it can get tedious. And maybe things you're doing for your family. Maybe things you're doing for the church. Maybe in your business and things you're doing. And you end up becoming frustrated and discouraged when you start to see the service that you're doing. And why is that? Why do we get so frustrated? I mean, Jesus commanded us to serve. And He said He came so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So we should be better because we're obeying God's command to serve. We should have satisfaction. We should have fulfillment. So why then does serving others frequently prove unsatisfaction? unsatisfactory or unfulfilling why is that well you know why because we're dealing with people that's why we get discouraged because usually the people we're serving often don't respond the way we hope them to respond or expect them to respond they don't seem to appreciate all the hard work and sacrifice that we do and some of them may even ignore you when you've done something for them or there's the people out there who take it for granted. Or even worse, who criticize you because of what you do. And I mean, you think to yourself, how dare they? Or you, whoever's around you may say that too. How dare they? After all I've done, it's discouraging when we do our best to help someone, perhaps even because of a personal sacrifice you did, and instead of gratitude, you hear grumbling and complaining and fault-finding, and you get hurt. And then when you get hurt, you get angry. And then if we're not careful, that anger turns into bitterness. And most of us have experienced this in our life. I'm, I'm sure you can all say, I've been there. If you're a parent of a teenager, you've been there. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. As the saying goes, no good deed ever goes unpunished. So when we get now to Psalms 123 and you look at this psalm, this is what the psalmist was feeling. As they made their journey, they understood they had to serve the Lord, but they were discouraged. Lord, we're serving you and it just doesn't seem like it's working. Psalms 123, a song of decrees. Unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servant look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of the maiden look unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God, until that He have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. So you can see through this psalm, the, the psalmist is dejected. He, he, the people feel unappreciated. They feel like they're being taken advantage of, and they don't want to feel that way. People look down to them because they're the Israelites, and they follow this God. They ridicule them. 
You know, it's one thing to serve those who appreciate and are grateful, but it's another thing to serve people who treat you poorly or behave to, if they, you know, you're supposed to do this. I deserve it. And it's real hard to keep loving and serving and sacrificing for, for people who don't even say thank you. I mean, if you sit there and you're, you're at the store and you open the door for somebody and, and, and they walk through and they just keep on walking and they don't say nothing to you, or, and you, you're wasting my time opening the door. That's how you feel, right? I mean, I feel the same way sometimes. You know, like Lisa could have said was thank you. So how do you cope with that? How do you find joy and satisfaction in serving others when the response to our service is indifference or criticism or contempt? How do you follow Christ in this way that gives abundant life as He promised? And the answer to see, you have to first realize we're not the only one with this problem. God had the same problem. Think about that. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 35. He said, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, and hope for nothing again, for your reward shall be great, and you shall be children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful, and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your God also is merciful. So the point of this verse is, is that we should follow the example of the Father in heaven. The Father in heaven blesses the ungrateful. He, he blesses those that are evil. He blessed the ungrateful people who wouldn't even worship Him. He's blessing the people that won't even acknowledge Him. Well, what do you mean He's blessing them? He gives them the same sunshine and the same rain and the same nice cool morning. God didn't just give that to you. Everybody out there had it this morning. To go do their evil things instead of being in the house of God. He blesses people who don't give Him thanks for His blessings. They don't recognize that it's God who supplied everything they have. They arrogantly, arrogantly insist that the good things they receive from God are actually, I got those. I worked hard for them. Or just dumb luck. You know, even people, you know, I'm not saying you should go out and play the lottery or anything, but even people that win the lottery, God gave it to them. Even though they think it was dumb luck. God supplied everything. And it's hard to understand, how could God bless these wicked people? These people curse His name. They reject His authority. They offer Him and offend Him with sin. They disgust Him. They anger Him. And He still loves them. And He still serves them every single day. And even Jesus, the most humble and loving and self-sacrificing man who ever lived, was hated and rejected. And in the end, He was crucified by those He came to save. Yet He continued to love them. And He continued to serve them, even up to death. He gave His life for His enemies. Paul said this in Romans 5, 6. Romans chapter 5 Verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would dare to die. But God commandeth His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. That's supreme love. That's supreme sacrifice. That's supreme service. God gave His life, not for His friends, not for good people, not for the righteous, but for the ungodly sinners who are enemies of God. And how many people you think that were standing at the foot of the cross understood or much less appreciated what Christ was doing for them? 
How many soldiers and spectators stood there and thanked him for what he was doing? I mean, I read they were taunting and insulting and jeering and laughing. And you can think, how heart-wrenching painful do you think that was? That was the, the pain of the cross isn't what was painful to him. It was what he was witnessing. So you think we should feel any different? And he could have simply spoke a word and all of them would have been annihilated. He could have been any time said, that's it, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to step down from the cross. I'm going to call the 10,000 angels to take me away and not die for your sins and you just die and go to hell. And he had the power to do that. But we have to realize that it was not the nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was His service and His love for us. And in spite of all the ingratitude He had, He gave His life. And if we aren't careful, we'll forget when it comes across people like this that every single one of us at one time was an enemy of God. If you haven't surrendered your life to Him, you're an enemy of God. It's only His grace and mercy which brought us to faith and changed us from enemies to now children of the Most Holy God. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death, to present you a holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. So when we continue to love people, when we continue to serve people, when we continue to give ourselves to people, even when they don't respond or they respond with ingratitude, all we're doing is following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're doing what the Master taught us to do, and we're doing it for others just like He did, but yet we think they don't deserve it because they don't appreciate it. And probably not. They don't deserve it and they don't appreciate it. But guess what? Neither did we. And there's a chance you can bring them to Christ through what you're doing. But what about all the, our hearts and the way we feel and, and the feelings we have? Even if we continue to serve, how do we get rid of this disappointment? How, how do we get rid of the fact that we keep doing things and people just don't seem to appreciate what we're doing for them? Find someone sometime that you're trying to reach that doesn't know Christ and will sit there and argue with you about the Bible and tell them you're praying for them. I've had people t tell me don't because don't do any good. How do you think that makes you feel? You feel hurt. Y you feel bad inside. What can we do? How can we deal with this? And we find that in the first two verses of our Psalms. Unto thee I lift up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in heaven. Behold, as the eyes of the servant look unto the hand of the master, or the eyes of the maiden look unto the hand of the mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that, we, until that he have mercy upon us. So how do you deal with all this? Here's the key. Look to God. And what that means is, first of all, look to the reason for our service in the first place. Are you serving to please and honor God? Or do you want the recognition for yourself? You know, our service should never be to make us feel good. Or to get thanks. Or to have recognition. We don't need to worry about what we're going to receive from people in return for our service. We shouldn't be keeping score. We shouldn't be tallying up what we're owed. No matter what it is we're seeking, whether we're expecting others maybe to do a favor in return, I did something for you, you do something for me. Or maybe you're expecting a, a thank you card or, or a kind word or, or you know, maybe even a monetary value. If your motive for ever doing something for someone 
is for self, you need to be before the Lord because you're missing something as a Christian walk. Our works of service shouldn't be done primarily for the benefit for the person we're serving. Even though what we're doing is helpful for them, and yes, you care about them, and yes, you want to show your love for them, but the reason you should be doing it is not to please anyone but God. And that's why it shouldn't matter how they respond. Listen to Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7. Ephesians 6, 7 says, With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, Paul said, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men knowing that the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for which you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever you do. Did you catch that? Whatever you do. Whether you're sitting at a computer terminal, whether you're teaching Sunday school, whether you're making a bed somewhere, whether you're making dinner for someone, whether you're sharing the gospel, whether you're singing a song, whether you're driving somewhere, whether you're spending time with someone who's lonely, remember that the true object of doing all that is not for the people, but for God. We're not just serving them, we're serving God. We're always performing for an ordained audience of one. He's the only one we should be trying to please. And if He is pleased, that's all the reward we need. It doesn't matter how people respond. It doesn't matter whether or not I receive the credit. It doesn't matter if I receive the recognition. All it really matters is the accommodation goes to God. Oh, we enjoy the affirmation. We enjoy the positive feedback. We like praise and thanks. But we shouldn't need them. It's not necessary. The goal is to please our Heavenly Father and His wonderful Son and to honor them. And if we succeed, that's all you need. That should satisfy you. Do you know someone who takes you for granted? Maybe you have a child who doesn't appreciate all you do for them. All they do is grumble and complain. Remember, you're not pleasing them, you're pleasing God. And He'll be pleased when you serve faithfully. Because in serving Him, you won't lose heart. And in serving them, you're actually serving Him. So don't give up. Hang on. And don't worry about it because the Lord will reward you. And in Galatians 6, chapter 9, Paul said, Let us not be weary in doing well. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are in the household of faith. So do you feel undervalued at work? Does your service to your employee go unrewarded? God sees your faithful labor. He sees your reward. Does it seem like your service to, to other believers goes unnoticed? Maybe your service in church isn't recognized. I was convicted studying this that maybe sometimes I don't say thank you enough to y'all for what you do for the Lord every single day. I can assure you that Christ does see it though and He does appreciate it, especially your service to Him. And anything you do in His name, even the smallest act of mercy will not go unrewarded. People may not notice, but God does. Matthew 25, verse 34 says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
Because when I was hungered, you gave me meat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. And in Matthew 25, verse 40, it says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as you have done it for the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So, so every act of service you do, whether it's holding open a door or, or whatever it is, it's the service of Christ. And God will reward you. But what if I expect all this? What if I make it all my primary goal, even as I serve others and serve God? Why do I still feel discouraged? What if the criticism and the negativity and the lack of appreciation still makes it difficult to serve others wholeheartedly? And isn't it a little bit unrealistic to think that I can just continue day after day serving and sacrificing and meeting others' needs and, and, and my own needs aren't being met and, and how can I keep giving without receiving? Guess what? You can't. And God doesn't expect you to. Listen to Psalms 123, 1 and 2. Remember it says, Unto thee I lift up my eyes, O that dwelleth in the heavens. So our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that He have mercy upon us. If we look to the Lord as our object of service, remember our primary goal is to serve and please Him. But we also look to Him in other ways. For strength. He's the source of our power. Oh, it's great to get the appreciation of the attaboys, the thanks, the gratitudes. And even if those are available to you, if you depend on them to fill you up emotionally, guess what? Someday it's going to run out. Someday you're not going to hear it. And maybe from the one person that was giving it to you. Because guess what? People are people. And one day our hero will next day be your goat. So what if this happens? You have no resources. You have no strength to continue servicing. Your energy to serve comes from the positive responses of people you're serving. And you become more and more dependent upon that. And then someday the well runs dry and you don't have anything left to give. And some of you this morning may feel that way already. You're looking for someone to supply what you need, but you're not finding it anymore. You need that little positive feedback to get you going. But then again, it ain't enough. And you've lost your strength to serve. And even worse, you lost your desire to. So what do you do? Look to God. Because people fail you, but God will not. Your own inner resources will eventually give out. God's resources never will. He promises a limited supply of strength and power. Listen to Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 says this. Has thou not known? Has thou not heard that the everlasting God... The Lord, the creator of the end of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And in John 15, chapter 15, 5, John, Jesus said, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, and without me, what? You can do nothing. So in order to do this, you have to spend your time in prayer. You have to spend your time in God's Word. You have to abide in Christ. 
And then draw your strength in your life from Him. And drink deeply of the Spirit. And trust in the renewing power of our God. His grace is always sufficient. And through His power, you're able to love, serve, and sacrifice. So our fourth step in our journey to the Lord. What do we learn from this? What must we pause and understand? First of all, don't look to this world. Look to the Lord. And all the service we do should be for Him. So as these families were gathering, as we saw last week, to travel, to worship Him, they understand how they must repent of the ways of this world. They must give their life over to Him. They must trust Him. They must come to Him in worship. They must surrender to Him. And they get to the point where they go, Well, you know, Lord, I'm having trouble because I'm, I'm trying to serve You. And they reflect on the fact that they finally understand in this journey that the service that you must do in this world cannot be done apart from the Lord. Otherwise, it becomes so hard to do. I hear people all the time, that you know, work's so terrible today. I just can't stand to be at work. I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. I can't deal with these people. I can't do that. Because you're trying to please the people and not please the Lord. Just do what the Lord called you to do, serve. He put you in a position to serve Him in whatever job you have right then and there. And when you realize the Lord put me here, I remember once somebody told me, well, I had a wonderful job. It was a great job and everything. But when I got there, I had to quit because people cussed there and I couldn't take it anymore. The Lord put you in that job to help those people learn how to speak in His way. And you decided you didn't want to serve Him because you were focusing on the people and not on the Lord. And that's what these people had to realize as they made this journey. So you can see all the steps we're taking is drawing us closer and closer to serving the Lord through our walk in life. And, and may we learn to learn these 15 steps to serve Him wholeheartedly. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank You for your message and your word. Lord, how, you know, you called us to serve. And, and that's why we're here. So many times I wonder, you know, my secular job, Lord, am I, am I supposed to be here? And things happen. They go, yeah, I'm still supposed to be here. You've got a reason. And sometimes I think, man, it's so much. But then I start to look to the Lord, and, and He's the one that holds me up. He's the one that gives me the strength to go on. And it's every day that you got to look to Him. And Lord, I just thank You for what You do. I, I praise You for the strength You give. I thank You for these steps to help us to understand what it means to draw closer to You every single day. And Lord, I just pray that everyone here this morning truly understands that service starts with surrendering to you. That's the first true act of service. But Lord, help us to see you now every day in our lives as we go through and see all the many little things we do that's an act of service for someone else. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, number 479, softly and tenderly. Is the Lord calling you this morning? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, He's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner. Come home. 
hope the message this morning just draws you close to the Lord. Uh, we'll uh, have a word of prayer before our business meeting. We'll just take a little bit of time now if you need to uh, stretch your legs or whatever for a minute and, and let others, and then we'll go into our business meeting uh, real quick. We won't be here long. Thank you all for being here, and I just hope that, that everything was a blessing to you this morning and just gives you a better relationship with our Lord and Savior. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We ask you to bless this business meeting we're going to go into shortly. And we thank you for everything you do for us every single day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So stretch your legs a little bit and we'll get in our business meeting.